Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. During this seminar, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation using questions submitted through the chat feature. To ask a question during the presentation, simply type your question in the chat box on the left side of the screen and click the Send button for it to go directly to the presenters. If you do not see the chat feature on the left side of your screen, please click the Show Chat button at the top left corner of the meeting screen. When you submit your question, it will be visible to all panelists, but will not be visible to other attendees. We cannot answer questions about individual medical situations during the seminar. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties during the presentation, you may submit a question through the Q&A feature or you may contact technical support at 1-800-843-9166. As a reminder, this presentation is being recorded for replay purposes. Welcome to Living with GIST. Please remember the information provided in this web seminar is not intended as a substitute for your physician's guidance and care. My name is Sarah Rothschild, the LifeRaft Group Program Director, and I am your moderator for today. We have a distinguished panel that is here to present today. I would like to introduce Dr. George Dimitri, he's the professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, the director of the Ludwig Center at Harvard, senior vice president for experimental therapeutics at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and a very dear old friend of the Life Raft Group. Next is uh, Dr. Lori Williams. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Symptom Research at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center and an Advanced Oncology Certified Nurse. And lastly, we have Jean Ann Braddock. She's an Oncology Dietitian at the John Thurer Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center. We'd like to transfer to Dr. Dimitri to begin. Dr. Dimitri, you can go ahead. Okay, give me one second to share the presentation with everyone. And I'd like to say thank you to everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, everyone's interest in GIST is most appreciated. I'm sure that many of you have family members who have been touched by this disease. And uh, as Sarah said, since the dawn of the Life Raft group, as well as the other patient advocacy groups, the GIST community has been really a tight-knit community to work together for the good of patients. So today, let me give a bit of an update, and this is all entitled Living with GIST. Ultimately, we hope that we can get people beyond living with GIST and cure the darn disease. But for the moment, I'm going to overview some experimental to standard therapies and then hopefully where we're going in the future. Now, this was the cover of Newsweek last year in uh, March. It says, solving cancer, you can't cure what you don't understand. And in many ways, that, that's true. We have learned a lot, though, from rare cancers. If all cancers were to be in this blue bubble, this is what GIST and other sarcomas make up, only 1% of human cancers. So before the year 2000, it was very difficult to get research in this area, but it's been very clear that over the past 15 years, the knowledge from studying this 1% of human cancers has been critical to advance the diagnosis and treatment of other far more common forms of cancer. So just to put the bubble in a different way, if this were to be all sarcomas, and GIST is a type of sarcomas, we view this as a model for precision cancer medicine or precision cancer therapies because sarcoma is not just one disease. It's actually many, many, many different diseases. And no one would have guessed back in 1999 or earlier that GIST was actually the most common form of sarcoma. This has been very clear through several studies. This happens to be from a French study that looked at all of the sarcomas in a province, in a series of three provinces, actually. And you can see that 18% of all sarcomas were actually GISTs. And that's very important. It's actually extremely important because for all of the sarcomas, there are only specific targeted therapies for GIST and that little 1% bar, which is 1% of 1% of sarcomas, and that thing is called dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. And those are two very different diseases, 
but they really were the model for saying, okay, if we understand what makes a disease tick, maybe, maybe we'll be able to match and then validate the targets, what's wrong with the cancer, with some new therapies. And this was our other tool that came around in the mid-1990s, Dr. Google, the second doctor that everybody turns to when they or a family member gets some sort of a diagnosis. And inevitably, somebody types this in. Tell me about my form of cancer. Tell me about my form of gist. Tell me something that my doctor might not know. And I just want to point this out, that what we've learned in gist has now been translated into many other cancers, including this one, lung cancer, was once thought of as a single disease treated with a one-size-fits-all type of chemotherapy. And it's quite clear that lung cancer's many, many different diseases, including EGFR-driven lung cancer. Now, that's a gene with its own specific targeted therapy, and the ALK-driven lung cancers with a different targeted therapy. And then you can see there are other slices of the lung cancer pie. So what this shows us is that as our field was for the last 60 or 100 years looking for that critical switch, what, what's locked on in cancers that makes the tumor cells grow and spread, and what could we do to turn that switch off so that the tumor cells stop growing, the cancer shrinks, or maybe if it's in the case of people with very limited disease in only one place, maybe it'll never come back if the surgeon takes it out. And in the 20th century, the big news was all about oncogenes. Oncogenes were a type of enzyme called tyrosine kinases. And throughout the 20th century, there were these links between oncogenes, these tyrosine kinases that were the abnormally active forms of an enzyme driven by these oncogenes, and sarcomas. So I won't go through this in any detail, but it turned out that it took some colleagues in Osaka, Japan, till 1998 to really break open the clue. This is a beautiful paper that our colleagues Hirota and Kitamura's group really linked this oncogene called KIT when it was mutated with a gain of function mutation to the disease called human gastrointestinal stromal tumor, or GIST. Many of you know already that in the year 2000, Heike Yuensu and, and I treated the very first patient with lots of disease there in the belly. And a month later, all of the disease went quiet. You can see the brain is still metabolizing, thankfully. You don't want to shut down the ability of the brain to eat glucose. But we did want to shut down the tumor's activity. When we treated later that year in July, the very first patient in the United States, on the top you see a colorful PET scan, on the bottom you see a CT scan of our first patient with truly massive metastatic recurrent gist. And again, a month later, the tumor shuts itself off, it shrinks, the patient felt better, all very, very, very dramatic. And at the end of 147 patients with our, with our multi-center study that included Meg von Marin at Fox Chase in Philadelphia, Mike Heinrich and Chuck Blanke out in Oregon Health Sciences University, and uh, others, including Heike Uensu back in, in Finland, we saw that there were 83% of patients benefited, including more than two-thirds of patients who shrank their tumors by more than 50% or so. So that was pretty impressive. The most important thing, though, is that people were living longer. Now, the way these curves work is that everybody starts at 1.0. That's the equivalent of 100%. And in the old days, before Gleevec, 100 patients or 100% of people would be alive, and every time the curve goes down, somebody would pass away from the disease. And it was a very rapid problem. The disease grew rapidly, and really chemotherapy only gave people side effects. In the era of imatinib, in our very first clinical trial, you see how even a little bit of imatinib, which is now the standard dose of 400 milligrams or a slightly higher dose, both of them had essentially the same impact, and people in the earliest study that started in the year 2000 were living five years on average, just on average, a median overall five-year survival. That's better than this these days. This is very important for everybody to know that the averages, even for people with metastatic spread gist, are better really because doctors are finding it earlier. And I think that's an important consideration. From treating patients with far advanced or recurrent disease, there was a lot of research now trying to say, well, what if the patient only has one lump that a surgeon could take out, and then you give the imatinib after the surgery to try to prevent the disease from ever coming back. That use of a drug therapy is called adjuvant therapy after the surgery. 
and there were several studies that looked at how long adjuvant therapy should be given. In this study, by again our colleagues Heike Yuensu and Peter Reichart in Germany, they treated many patients after the first GIST was taken out, and you can see that the patients who took the imatinib for three years after the surgery did better than the patients who only took the imatinib for one year. Now, I want to emphasize that these patients were the highest risk patients. They had all sorts of criteria for being at high risk for the disease to come back. I would say that at least 50% of patients who have a GIST resected or taken out by a surgeon do not even need a drug therapy. Those patients can be cured by surgery alone, and it's important to talk to doctors about what the risk assessment is on any individual GIST, because not all GISTs are destined to come back. Our surgeons can easily cure about half of the GIST patients just with surgery. But for the ones who have particular risk factors, such as a high mitotic rate, a location in the small intestine, or a very big GIST that's in the small intestine or elsewhere, those patients can benefit by having the surgery and then following it up with adjuvant imatinib for at least three years. So what's happened over the last 15 years is a great deal of understanding of what drives the tumor. If this membrane is the outer cell membrane, the kit looks like a periscope just poking through the membrane, and that is an enzyme that's poking through, and the problem with GIST is that often there's a mutation, most commonly in that part, just inside the cell membrane. And fortunately, that happens in about 60 to 60% 60 to 75% of GISTs, and fortunately the way it works is that that type of mutation is particularly sensitive to having imatinib work very, very well. There are other places that the kit um, tyrosine kinase, it's called a receptor tyrosine kinase, there are other places that it could be mutated in other people. So if 7 out of 10 people have that mutation, about 8 out of 100 people will have the mutation just outside the cell membrane, but still that's moderately sensitive to the imatinib drug. Very rarely, 1 out of 100 people might have a mutation elsewhere in this exon 13. Usually that's not sensitive, but every now and then it can be sensitive to imatinib. And then we found a look-alike kinase, this thing called PDGFRA, which stands for platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha, or just PDGFRA to its friends. Look at where that can be mutated. Now, some people who don't have the mutation in KIT may have it in PDGFRA in the same place, right inside the cell membrane. Look how similar they look. And fortunately, that's also sensitive to imatinib, but unfortunately, it's a very rare one, 0.3 people out of 100. That means three out of 1,000 will have that mutation, extremely rare. Now, about 13 people out of 100 with GIST will have no mutation in either of these two enzymes, and those used to be called wild type because in fruit fly genetics, remember fruit flies gave us a lot of the information about genetics back in the 1900s, those were turned wild type because those were the normal flies, not laboratory flies with mutations, but normal flies. Unfortunately, in human genetics, sometimes that phrase wild type sticks, and it just means there's no mutation. It turns out that that is more common than we thought, particularly in younger people. Like I say, 13 people with just out of 100 are going to have no mutation in either KIT or PDGFRA, but they do happen to have an abnormality in another series of genes called SDH for succinyl dehydrogenase. And it could be SDHA, SDHB, SDHC. There's a series of them. That's a very different disease. I just wanted to point that out for one second because it is moderately common. And then the last group are the ones who have very difficult to treat disease right from the get-go because in either KIT or PDGFRA, the mutation could be way down low in the tail that sits deep inside the cell. In KIT, that's called exon 17. In PDGFRA, it's called exon 18. And those are exon mutations that lead to a protein, the enzyme, that can be very difficult to control with all of the available drugs today. Now, a lot of our GIST patients on our early trials picked this up very early, that the people with these different exons were doing very differently with the first-line drug, imatinib. It turns out that the different exons conferred different 
sensitivities. And the people who have the kit mutant exon 11 all the way up at the top, they were doing the best and continued to do the best over time. Those people with exon 9 kit mutant were kind of intermediate. And the people who did not have any kit mutations fell into two groups, the group that did not do very well with the early imatinib. And then you'll see there's a straight flattening of that line, meaning many of those people continued to do very well for a long time. Turns out many of those are those SDH mutant GIST patients who tend to do pretty well for a long time anyways. In the early days when we would have patient advocacy group meetings and patients would introduce themselves, they literally would put this on their name badge. They knew where their mutation was in the tumor, and they would introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Jane, exon 9. Oh, did you see Fred over there? He's an exon 13. Things like that. And actually, I think the patients caught the importance of this kind of molecular precision medicine earlier than many doctors did. And I, and I have great respect for our patients and for the advocacy groups for really spreading this message that mutations matter. So this is why, because there are many different kinds of GIST. Now you remember, GIST is only 18% of all sarcomas, which is only 1% of all human cancers. So now you're talking little subsets of already a rare disease. And one thing we've learned is that patients and their families really need to understand this because many doctors who are very busy in their practice, well-meaning, wonderful expert doctors, they might not see enough GIST to really be up to date with the latest research and the latest standards of care. And that's why knowing where one falls in this list, whether it's a kit mutant in the GIST, whether it's a PDGFRA mutant in the GIST, and which mutation it is, that's important, whether it's an SDH mutation or something else called an SDH deficiency, which has nothing to do with mutation. The code is normal, but for whatever reason, the code is not being read. So those are particularly interesting to us because, again, that's a different disease, even though it's called GIST. And then at the bottom in purple, you see the BRAF or NF1 mutations. Now, BRAF is a very targetable gene that's mutated in about two-thirds of melanoma patients. So suddenly, again, we see that similarity between cancers. What does a melanoma have to do with GIST? It can be linked by that BRAF, but those are vanishingly rare. There may be one in a thousand, again, of those. So it's important for people to educate themselves. What we also knew is that like with any antibiotic, resistance could also occur to an anti-cancer targeted drug like imatinib. If this is the most common first presentation of GIST, a kit mutant exon 11 GIST, when exposed to imatinib for long enough, that exon 11 sticks around, that's that pink star, but over time other parts of the gene can mutate especially in exon 17 or exon 13, and that can basically give the tumor an advantage as if the imatinib's no longer being given. All the imatinib in the world might not make a difference if the tumor mutates to these other kinds of mutations. And this is sort of what it looks like. Here's a patient with spread disease in the liver. It turns nice and black and smaller after one month, and then after about nine months in this patient who had an exon 9 mutation, you'll see those little dots inside the tumor. Those are the little cells that are now starting to grow that were there beforehand. We know that for a wide variety of reasons. I won't bore you. But the point is each of those three different dots have different resistance mutations. So there comes to be an evolution of resistance in the setting of metastatic GIST, which is really why we like to utilize the best surgery to remove the disease as much as possible and not give those cells a fighting chance to ever grow again in the future. Well, how do you fix resistance? The way we did it early on was to pick a new drug. This drug was called sunitinib. That's the generic name. In the early days, it was called SU11248. You'll see it has a much bigger red bubble around that kit target, and that just means it's a more powerful kit inhibitor but you'll also notice a lot more red bubbles, and that means that it just hits a lot more things, so it has more side effects. So no surprise, this actually worked in many patients, like this patient who had a lot of disease that was active at baseline that imatinib or Gleevec could never shut down. After a few days, this patient felt better, and you could see how all the tumors shut off, and yet after two months, the CT scan did not show any big difference. 
This is because, again, these tumors can be tricky, and it can take a long time for the CT scans to catch up, as long as they're not growing, though. That's a good thing. This patient was not having the tumor grow, and the PET scan was very reassuring. And eventually, we figured out that this had a little elbow, that threonine, that THR670, was poking out. The new drug, the sunitinib, could sneak right under it into the protein and shut off the kit, but the imatinib would bump into it and would not work. So that explained why imatinib was failing in this patient who had an exon 13 mutation. But of course, our friend Jane, who might have had an exon 9 to start, over time may develop other exon mutations in the same gene, in the same kit gene, and that can complicate things. And so that's why we developed the third drug, generic name regorafenib, which inhibits kit as well as a number of other things here. And the bottom line on this, as you see on the right where it says drug sensitivity, where yellow is resistance, the fact is imatinib works pretty well for two to three years in most people with metastatic disease, but eventually the, the tumor cells turn resistant and they turn that yellow color based on the molecular changes. And then sunitinib can work for a while if the sensitive part is the part that's mutated. And then the regorafenib has a slightly broader spectrum of activity, but even the regorafenib has a yellow box there with some resistance to it. But you'll notice that the sunitinib boxes, the turquoise, and the regorafenib boxes are complementary there. So we were excited in the early days of regorafenib because that drug got approved very quickly from our very first testing here at Dana-Farber in the year 2010 to the FDA approval for GIST in 2013. It was a, it was a very collaborative event. And I would say that we also had a good collaboration with Pfizer and Sugen before this one that gave us sunitinib and with Novartis in the early days that gave us imatinib. What we do see is this problem. This line chart really means that if you start with one mutation, in this case it happens to be kidney cancer, but you could replace a VHL with kit in that point, and then you could see other mutations spring off from there. It's remarkably similar to what Charles Darwin noted with the finches back in 1837, that if you have one type of finch, they eventually evolve into different kinds of beaks. And bottom line is this is just nature. Cancer is nature with acceleration. These cancer cells will try to figure drugs out. I won't bore you with all this, but it turns out that there's all sorts of different mutation frequencies in all sorts of cancers. And by looking at that, we're trying to now mix and match the drugs so we get the best sensitivity for the patients. In this case, it happens to be a few days of sunitinib, a few days of regorafenib, a few more days of sunitinib. This is a study run by my colleague, Dr. Suzanne George. Uh, we're doing it carefully. I would not advise doing this at home, but I would advise people to try to sign up for this if at all possible so that we can learn as much and move the mechanisms forward. And then we have many new options that I'm not going to have the time to get into in any detail, but the mutation-specific therapies are coming. The drugs that are specifically targeting those difficult-to-treat PDGFRA options, those mutations, those drugs are coming. The BRAF-targeted drugs, specific kit-inhibiting drugs, as well as new metabolic targeting and epigenetic targeting of the SDH mutant GIST subtypes, those, those formerly known as wild types as well as new combinations of drugs known as tyrosine kinase inhibitors, imatinib, sunitinib, and regorafenib are all TKIs, or tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Those are various inhibitors, and hopefully new immuno-oncology approaches, ways of waking the immune system up, although GIST seems to be a very difficult target without a lot of flags that put the immune system to sleep that we might be able to wake up. So it's a very difficult challenge whether the advances made in melanoma will ever be able to be made for GIST, but we're still working on this. And I think it's also important for patients and their families to be advocates and say, is there a clinical trial that might be right for me, either at the first step or at the second step or third step, any step in GIST management? It's always a good question whether there's a clinical trial for a patient. There are many ways of maybe making tumors extinct. I'm not going to go through these, but this is a big part of the research at every center. It's extremely exciting, and most importantly, the fact that you're all on the call means that patients themselves and their families are smarter than ever with better tools through the Internet and Dr. Google than ever before, allowing patients better access to information for decision-making and to find and participate in clinical trials. Our hope is that by crowdsourcing these tools, we can help 
both the research and the patients, matching the patients to the right trials and matching the trials to the right patients so that the research can move ahead quickly and get people whatever benefits they possibly can get from the best possible science. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you for listening, and I will figure out how to pass the control back to my colleagues. There we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Dimitri. This is a fascinating presentation about the evolution of treatment for uh, the GIST patient community. I want to thank you for your time today. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Lori Williams. So I'm just going to go to the first slide. Okay, Lori, you can begin. Okay, thank you um, very much. Um, and that was a great presentation. Uh, about GIST. So now I'm going to move us on and talk a little bit about the symptoms and side effects um, of GIST and uh, some of the common treatments, um, what they are and what to do about it. Um, first of all, I want to be clear about what I'm calling a symptom. Um, this is something that's an abnormal symptom sensation or function that's due to disease or treatment, and it's reported by patients. So it's not something that the doctor would notice. What the doctor would notice, we're going to call a side effect. And that would be abnormal function due to the disease that the doctor notices. So that would be a lab test, for instance, or a scan, or your blood pressure, something like that that's out of whack. But the symptom would be more like pain or fatigue, nausea. Um, even something like diarrhea, although if you're in the hospital, certainly people could notice that, but otherwise the doctor is not going to notice that. So that, that's kind of the difference between a symptom and a side effect. And both are very important. And so that's why uh, we, I think in the last few years it's, it's become recognized that it's much more important to ask patients about what symptoms they're having um, when they visit their physician so that the physician and the patient can work together on controlling both the symptoms and the side effects that the doctor can know without actually asking the patient. Um, and it's becoming more common now to actually have um, questionnaires that, that have been developed to actually ask about these symptoms. And that's one thing that I do most of the time is develop these questionnaires. So. Um, when we develop these, we call, usually call what, what we want to look at as symptom burden. This kind of helps healthcare providers as they're trying to work with the patient to control these things to know what would be the most important to control. And so symptom burden is the, really the effect of the symptoms on your daily functioning. And I think for most people, um, a symptom that you have that doesn't affect your daily functioning uh, may be at times annoying, but uh, the ones that really affect your daily functioning are the ones that you'd most like to get under control or at least make a little bit better. So um, what we did in order to um, find, discover the sim symptoms uh, that are particularly related to GIST and its treatment was the first thing we did, we actually talked to patients to ask them what were they experiencing. And we did interviews with um, 20 patients who had just some of them had um, had surgery and some of them were getting chemotherapy and some had had both. Um, so we got a, a kind of a cross section of the um, just population, and we also talked to some who had just in different you know different areas. They just had started you know in their um, stomach or large intestine, small intestine, wherever. Um, we, after we had interviewed the patients, and we did, we just let the patients talk to us and tell us what symptoms they were experiencing. We didn't suggest anything to them. We said, you tell us what it is that's bothering you. Um, after we did that, we went through these interviews and pulled all of the symptoms out and we developed a list of all the symptoms the patients had told us. And then we asked what we called our expert panel to rate the relevance of these symptoms because we had 40 some symptoms at that point and we really didn't want to on a routine basis be asking patients to tell us about 40 different symptoms. So 
We um, ask physicians who took care of patients with GIST. We ask nurses and other healthcare providers who took care of patients with GIST. And we did, again, ask some GIST patients and their family members which of these symptoms were the most relevant to a patient with GIST. And that narrowed our list down to seven. Well, no, it's actually tw we had 20 symptoms. We had um, 13 that we asked for of just all cancer patients, and many of those were important to GIST patients. And then we had seven more that were just really specific to GIST. And then we asked 150 patients with GIST every one to two weeks for a year to use our questionnaire to rate their symptoms. And um, that was, and then from that we finally decided on our final list. And this is kind of what our questionnaire looks like. Um, and you bas basically a patient just rates the symptom at its worst in the last 24 hours from zero, meaning the symptom wasn't present at 10, it was as bad as they can imagine. And then after they've rated the 20 symptoms that we found that were important for GIST, um, we ask about six areas of functioning that we think are probably important to patients. Patients have told us this in the past. And it includes their general activities, mood, work, um, relations with other people, walking, and enjoyment of life. And that way we kind of can figure out um, how much are symptoms interfering with the functioning and what are the worst, which symptoms are, are the worst, so that then for any individual patient, we're now kind of personalizing the treatment. What would be the symptoms, what are the highest rated symptoms that would be the most important to address for that patient? And so what were the most severe symptoms that out of our group, 150 patients we, with GIST, we found um, coming up again and again? Um, fatigue was the worst. Probably you all can identify with that. Drowsiness, a general weakness, disturbed sleep, and muscle soreness or cramping. Um, I think some of these symptoms are probably related to the GIST, some are related to the treatment, and some are a combination of both. Um, so now, after this, uh, we also went through the literature and looked to see what other symptoms besides the ones we were asking about were being reported. And so these are the ones that I think you can kind of um, figure out um, would probably be the ones that you could also most endorse if you're a patient. And symptoms that are, uh, and side effects that were related just to the GIF specifically, to the disease itself. Um, seem to be pain in the abdomen, nausea, vomiting, and bleeding from the GI tract. Those were the, the three symptoms that patients who were newly diagnosed with GIST were most often reporting. Additional symptoms that they were reporting included fatigue, distress, constipation, and difficulty swallowing. And that difficulty swallowing would depend on where the, and the constipation usually would depend on where the, the tumor was actually located. Um, side effects that would be found from the GIST, in other words, the things that your doctor could find. Um, low hemoglobin was the most common thing the doctors found, and a mass in the abdomen was also fairly common that could be found on physical examination. Um, so what would be the symptoms and side effects then of the patients who go on to have surgery for their GIST because we would expect at this point then that these symptoms and what's important might change a little bit. And for patients who were getting uh, surgery, right after the surgery, the two most important things for them were pain and fatigue. Um, that's pretty common with surgeries. In addition, some patients were experiencing nausea and vomiting or constipation. Um, again, this, if they were experiencing constipation before from the disease itself, they might be experiencing it now because they're getting a lot of pain medications. Uh, patients also might be distressed after surgery, again, primarily probably because um, of the other side effects that they're experiencing and symptoms such as the pain. And then they also sometimes had lack of appetite and disturbed sleep. Um, in terms of side effects, um, that the doctor might notice that they're the two that occur sometimes but are not real common but do occur. There may be an infection from the, 
the, from the surge, at the surgical site or a lit, low hemoglobin because of blood loss during the surgery. And then blood clots do occur occasionally, probably related to being in bed a lot after, immediately after the surgery. There are things that can be done to help prevent that, though, so those are not very common at all. Uh, finally, then, we're going to get into the side effects now, the treatments for GIST. And what are the side effects that patients tend to report when they're getting imatinib? And this is particular to GIST patients, although I've done work with other patients who get imatinib. And this seems to be pretty consistent across for all patients who are receiving imatinib. And the most common symptom with imatinib and the most disturbing is fatigue. This is followed by the GI symptoms of either nausea, diarrhea, or both. And then also muscle aches or cramping is fairly common um, with imatinib. Um, rash is reported sometimes, but this is less common, and bleeding. And um, so these, these are then the, the, the symptoms, mostly with imatinib. The one that that I did not find, that did not make it on here, though, that I know that patients with imatinib sometimes complain to me about also is the swelling, uh, either in the face, around the eyes, um, sometimes in the abdomen, or sometimes in the extremities. Um, side effects that can occur with imatinib that the doctor might notice, one that's fairly common is mildly elevated liver function tests. And your doctor, if you're on imatinib, probably checks your liver on a fairly regular basis just to be sure this isn't happening. If you've been on it a while and it hasn't happened, then you're probably okay with that. Um, sometimes patients on imatinib get the, this fluid retention not where it's real visible externally, but they would get it around the heart or lungs. And this will occasionally then lead to the symptom of shortness of breath if it's really bad. So that's one reason that we do like to ask patients on imatinib about if they're having shortness of breath, because it can be an indicator of that. Um, low blood counts and infection sometimes occur with imatinib. And then even less common, uh, our abnormal blood tests from liver or kidney damage, not just this mildly elevated liver function, but actually uh, where damage has occurred. Weight loss will occur occasionally, particularly if there's a lot of, of GI symptoms, nausea and diarrhea. Sometimes high blood sugar or low blood calcium. Um, this low blood calcium can come because people on imatinib can also have low vitamin D levels. And, um, that can sometimes interfere with the way calcium is processed by your body. And then this low blood calcium can sometimes lead to other problems with bones and teeth. Um, what about sunitinib, which um, is, an, is another one of the approved treatments for GIST? Again, fatigue is a real common uh, problem with sunitinib. Uh, followed by the GI symptoms of diarrhea or nausea and vomiting. Occasionally, people will get a sore mouth or a lack of appetite with sunitinib. Um, then less common would be bleeding, rash, or skin changes. There's less muscle soreness and cramping with sunitinib, at least that's what we find when we ask patients, than there is with matinib, but it still can occur. And headache, sometimes patients report it. In terms of side effects from sunitinib, it is more likely than imatinib to cause a low white blood cell count, and that is fairly common. Um, less common is infection or fevers, a low platelet count, sometimes high blood pressure, um, or abnormal blood tests from the liver, from liver, kidney, or even pancreatic damage. And then very rarely there are heart problems that are reported. Uh, actual liver or kidney failure, blood clots have nor normal thyroid level levels, or damage to the jawbone. Again, this is related to calcium um, and, and, and bone um, resorption. And finally, regorifenib is the last approved treatment for GIST at this point. And so some of the common symptoms that are seen with it is, again, fatigue. Fatigue seems to come out as really important with all of these. Um, some of the GI symptoms, lack of appetite, diarrhea, and with this drug, sore mouth or throat also, again, which can interfere with eating. Uh, rash or skin pain is common, uh, sometimes bleeding and hoarseness. Um, less common would be headache, change in taste, 
or the muscle aches or cramping. So with all of these treatments, because they do target some similar pathways, we see somewhat similar symptoms, just kind of the, the, um, the, uh, the severity of them will vary with the different drugs. In terms of side effects, there is some weight loss that's reported with regorifenib or infections. Again, the high blood pressure similar to the sunitinib, low white blood cell or platelet counts. Um, oh, I've got an infection on there twice. It's not twice as important. That was a mistake. And abnormal uh, lab tests from liver or kidney damage again. Then less common are the low thyroid, liver, low, low thyroid levels, severe liver damage, um, heart attack, or a hole in the stomach or intestine that would cause bleeding. So, but what do we do about these symptoms? Because, I mean, that's the most important thing. And the most important thing, too, is for you to be aware, particularly both with your disease and whatever treatment you're on, what symptoms you might be experiencing so you can let your doctor know if you are experiencing these things. And even if it's not on the list, if it's something that you notice it's important when you see your doctor to let them know, and if it seems serious, pick up the phone and call even before you see the doctor. But let your doctor know. And then when should you let your doctor and nurse know? Well, I can't, again, it depends on how serious you think it is. If you're short of breath, let them know right away because that's very serious. Um, if it's a mild rash and you're due to see them in a few weeks and it's not getting any worse, you can probably let that go. Um, fatigue, if it kind of stays the same again, that's something that you can, if it's at a, um, a moderate level that you can work through that wouldn't need to be reported until you saw them. Um, then what is causing the symptom? Again, sometimes it could be the treatment, could be the disease. Um, you, don't you can't necessarily always judge that, so don't always worry that when you get a new symptom, it's the disease because it could be the treatment. But again, if it is the disease and your doctor, it helps your doctor identify that you're relapsing earlier, that might be a good thing versus letting it go. So that's why it's always important to let someone know. So you can keep track of your symptoms too. You can keep just your own little notes or you can get something like one of the questionnaires and fill it out on a regular basis and kind of keep track of, gee, my symptom, you know, my fatigue last week was a five and I think it's down to a three this week. Maybe it's getting better. Um, that can be good too. And then what can you do for yourself? If you have medication that your doctor has told you to take if you need it, take it when you need it. Um, I know sometimes I'll talk to patients and they'll say, I've been so nauseated the last three or four days. And I'll say, well, did, did they give you medication for it? And they'll say, yes. I said, have you taken it yet? Well, no, I was waiting to throw up. Well, you know, take it before it gets too bad. Or pain medication is the same way. So if you have medication, take it. Um, and if there's anything that you know worked for you in the past, for heaven's sakes, do that too, as long as your doctor didn't tell you that you shouldn't do it. Um, sometimes taking over-the-counter medications uh, isn't a good thing, so you need to check with your doctor. But um, if, it worked for, if, you, if it's okay with your doctor and it worked for you in the past, do that again. Okay, so what do you do for specific symptoms? For fatigue, what we know, the one thing that we know works for fatigue um, is activity. And I know that sounds funny because if you have not been very active and you're really tired, you're like, how could I do more? But um, we do know that if you can start being more active, and you may have to start very slowly. I will tell my patients sometimes if they're really fatigued, just try to get up several times during the day and walk around your house a little bit. Do it a little more than you were before. And maybe after a week or so, maybe you could walk out and get the mail. And I'll tell them to keep doing that and see if eventually they can't work up um, to being more active. Um, if you already are somewhat active but you're feeling fatigued, just try to increase gradually. Um, a lot of our patients do get sent for, to a physical therapist for rehabilitation to develop a program of increasing activity. Um, the other thing about fatigue, though, is it can sometimes be due to physical causes that your doctor can find, such as your hemoglobin being low. And so that can sometimes be corrected. Or you can have some other kind of electrolyte imbalance. So it is always important, or low thyroid, 
it's always important to have somebody check those things, but if they're all normal, then activity seems to be the best um, treatment for fatigue. Um, pain, including headache, again, there are various medications that can be used for pain. Sometimes relaxation will work, too. So that's something that it need, you need to figure out how severe the pain is, what's going to work, and then whatever works for you, do it. But there are treatments, and so let your doctor know if you're having pain. Nausea and vomiting. Um, again, medications are important. Also, sometimes the smells of warm foods really increase nausea. So often we tell our patients to eat cold things and stay away from a lot of odors. And um, frequent small meals. Sometimes if you try to eat too much and if someone sets a big plate of food in front of you, that will make the nausea worse. If you have just a very small amount of food or little snacks, that, you'll, that will help and uh, you'll eat more than if you, um, if you try to, to eat a big meal all at once. Lack of appetite. Eat if you're having a lack of appetite and anything sounds good to you eat that. Uh, don't worry at that point about trying to maintain a balanced diet. And we're going to have a dietitian in just a minute talk to you more about this. Um, sore mouth or, th or throat, again, there are some medications that you can use for that. Um, baking soda rinses for your mouth are really good if you've got mouth sores. That's, nurses love those. And, and those are, there is actually evidence that that may be one of the best things to do. But there are, sometimes if you've got discrete mouth sores, there are some uh, topical anesthetics that, that can be applied. And again, watch out for foods and things that might irritate it at that point. Diarrhea, again, there are medications to help. Let your doctor know. Let your doctor evaluate the diarrhea, what's causing it, and see if you can't control it. Uh, muscle aches and cramping. Um, sometimes there are things like replacing certain electrolytes such as calcium that will help or magnesium. Sometimes that doesn't help. Uh, different people find that different things helps, help with, helps with that. I think that's pretty trial and error and talk to your doctor about it. A rash, um, often if it's mild, your doctor will probably talk to you and you'll just decide to try to live with it, keep your skin um, clean and not get it any more irritated. Um, be careful about putting on, uh, you know, check with your doctor before you put any lotion or anything on it. Be sure that it's not something that's going to cause more irritation. Um, and then if, it, if it's worse, there may be some things that you can be given some either topical anti-inflammatories or oral anti-inflammatories. Um, to treat it, and sometimes it does necessitate either a little bit of a drug holiday until it gets better or decreasing dose. Again, constipation, it's important to keep on top of constipation, so there's medications. Your doctor can help you with this. Just be sure you let them know because then they can help you, the doctor and the nurse, with taking the correct, uh, getting the correct mix of medications to control the constipation without getting you into the other extreme is diarrhea. And finally, bleeding. Again, that's, that's a symptom that's important to let your doctor know because that could become serious. So uh, again, with the side effects that your doctor notices, he'll let you know what he wants to do about them. He knows what's going on and he'll let you know what he or she will let you know. May ask you to monitor your blood pressure at home if it's a, if it's a big enough concern, and that's pretty easy to do nowadays. If you have a low white blood count, for heaven's sakes, wash your hands often and avoid crowds and people who have infections. You know, don't tell people if they want to come visit you if they've got a cold or something to stay away. You appreciate um, their helpful, their, their concern for you, but you'd be better off not being around them. Um, wa again, watch for signs of infection. Most often that's a fever. So take your temperature frequently, particularly if you feel like you have it. Um, for some of the, the tooth and bone problems, maintain good dental hygiene and have regular dental checkups. Um, be sure you check with your doctor before you do this and have your doctor and dentist work together on this because if you have some serious dental problems, uh, there are certain 
things that should be done about them or shouldn't be done that will reduce the risk of you make, maybe possibly getting into even more problems. So it's very important here for the doctor and the dentist to work together. Um, watch for yellowing of your skin or eyes. This would indicate that you're getting into a liver problem. And so if you would ever notice that, if you, if you already know your liver enzymes are somewhat elevated, then just be aware that if that would happen, let your doctor know right away. And uh, watch for excessive thirst or urination because that could indicate that you're having some blood sugar or pancreatic problems. So this was my study team who worked with me on developing our questionnaire. And I'm happy to share that questionnaire through the LifeRaft group with any of you all if you would like it. And actually, it was Novartis who helped us develop that questionnaire. They gave us some money to do that. So um, I'm finished now, and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Lori. It was an excellent presentation. Uh, we next have Jean Ann Braddock, who is an oncology dietitian, and she's actually here in our office today giving the presentation. We are running a bit behind. Um, I know that Dr. Dimitri has to leave in a bit, so um, we may uh, want to just ask a few questions for him um, right now so we can catch him, because there were a lot of questions that came in. And uh, we, we definitely want to grab him while we can to ask these questions. So uh, Dr. Dimitri, are you available um, for a moment for us to ask you a few questions? I am. The other thing, if you wanted to stay on time, if you wanted to just forward them to me and I could try to just email, it's up to you, Sarah, whatever you want. Okay. You know what? We're going to ask a few questions and then any right. spillover questions will forward them along to you. Thank you so much for offering to do that. Okay, the first question is, what is the likelihood that a parent who has passed the mutation onto a child will present with GIST themselves? Well, the only kinds of mutations that really present in families are those SDH mutations. The, the numbers of families with KIT mutant or PDGFR mutants that really run in families are, are vanishingly rare. The more common type is the SDH type. And the SDH type of GIST, we don't really understand why some people get that. And ultimately, you'll see the parent may not have it, even though they have the same SDH deficiency. That is still a point of great interest. Uh, so I don't think we have good numbers on that. I, I do think that it is important for people to know if they're one of those families. And it, it may have to do with gene dosage. It may have to do with whether the other copy, the parent almost certainly has one copy of the deficient SDH being read and one copy that's normal. So th there are many other things that play into that. And I guess that's the only way I would answer that question. So it's worth talking to the doctor about uh, the specifics for, for any such patient. OK, thank you. A next question for you, Dr. Dimitri. How often should patients who have failed all approved drugs be getting scans done? Is there benefit to biopsy and type these tumors and mutational type these tumors? Yeah, so this is a point of, of individual medicine rather than something that we can make broad categorizations. It really depends on what the disease is doing in the patient how and why the disease is failing. So for example, typically the SDH deficient GIFs can fail the drugs, but fail very slowly over the course of months or years. It's a very different disease than some of the exon 17 kit resistant diseases that can move very quickly once the drugs fail. And remember, patients don't fail drugs, drugs fail patients. So we're trying to develop better drugs that don't fail patients. I would think that that, again, is something that has to be discussed specifically with the, with the doctor taking care of the patient because everybody's kinetics, everybody's case of disease can vary. And then it's a, there's still no real evidence that any kind of biopsying outside of a research study really helps us to direct therapy. That's because, just like the pictures I show, if one biopsies one lump, there may be a lump somewhere else in the body with a totally different genetic problem and so you don't know anything about that from a biopsy. So I'm always very careful to say to people, we're not that smart. We don't really know how to get the whole picture of all the mutations in any GIST patient's body, especially after all three of the approved GIST drugs have, have not worked. 
Okay, and then next question is, are either alternating or com combining drugs viable treatment options for resistant GIST? Well, certainly in the context of research studies, I would say yes. I would definitely say combining drugs at the same time is fraught with peril because many of these drugs, as you've just heard, can have similar side effects. And so you wind up running the risk that instead of giving two drugs together and having both work really well, you run the risk of having to give less of each drug and therefore having neither drug work very well. So I think that's why research is done. We're trying to figure out how to mix and match the available drugs while we develop newer drugs that might pair better uh, within themselves. So I think that, that would be the answer to that. Again, doctor, there's no substitute for talking about that with a doctor, and certainly a doctor who knows a lot about GIST would be the preference there. Okay, and I'll just ask one last question to you, um, sort of, um, as a follow-up to what you were just mentioning, I know that earlier you were uh, talking about a trial at Dana-Farber um, with sequencing. Do you have any news on any other current promising drug trials out there for our audience to learn about? Well, I would just say that the year 2015 is going to be a great year for GIST research. There are a number of drugs that have entered clinical trials, a number of drugs that are about to enter clinical trials. And again, rather than show favoritism in any way towards any one drug, I, I do think it's important that people know that some of the smarter of the smart drugs, the ones that are really more targeted to the resistance mechanisms and some of the combinations are part of this new class of trials. So I do think it's, it's good. Clinicaltrials.gov is a good fair website that's hard to work through because it talks about all clinical trials. So it's very, very difficult for the average person to use clinicaltrials.gov, I think. But that's why, you know, doctors and the research teams that most of the GIST centers have help patients to find their way through the various trial options and hopefully find a trial that might be uh, appropriate for their disease and for their preferences. Excellent. And I just want to add also the LifeRef group maintains um, up-to-date information on clinical trials relevant to GIST patients, and we also monitor clinicaltrials.gov. So if anybody wants to go to our website, um, they're welcome to do so to get more information on that area. Um, so uh, I know that there are other questions for Dr. Dimitri, um, but we, since I said before, we are running out of time. So I'm going to um, transfer over now to Jean Ann Braddock to continue with her presentation, and I want to thank Dr. Dimitri for his time today. Thank you. Thanks, Ari, and thanks, everybody, for, for your attention today. Bye-bye. So my topic today is nutritional management of GIST. And just to review some very brief facts, um, as Dr. Dimitri mentioned, GIST is a very uncommon type of sarcoma, but I wanted to mention it can be found anywhere along the gastrointestinal tract. The American Cancer Society estimated that 4,000 to 5,000 new cases of GIST were diagnosed in this country last year in 2014. And of the different statistics that I found, 60 to 70 percent of GIST occur in the stomach, so that's the primary organ. Approximately 20 to 30 percent occur in the small intestine, and roughly the remaining 10 percent occur in the esophagus, colon, rectum, and anus. And the reason I bring this up is that as I continue to speak, um, we'll be talking about those different sites. So the main treatment options for GIST, first there's surgical resection, which has tremendous potential for nutritional implications, as well as the medications that were already mentioned by Dr. Dimitri and Dr. Williams, um, Gleevec, Sutin, and Stavarga. So the primary surgical sites for GIST would be the esophagus and then the stomach, the small intestine, which is comprised of three different sections, the duodenum or duodenum, however you prefer to pronounce it, jejunum and ileum, then finally the colon and finally the rectum or anus. So I bring up this slide because there are some sphincters that I just wanted to identify on your slide. 
um, although they're not identified by words, if you follow the esophagus down to the stomach, and you can see the very beginning of the stomach just behind the um, corner of the liver, there's a sphincter or valve there that I'm going to be mentioning in subsequent slides, and that valve can play a very, very important role from a nutrition perspective. Then there's also a valve at the very end of the stomach, just before the duodenum. And then finally, as we go all the way through the GI system, there's another valve that's all the way down near the anus. And these valves or sphincters um, I will be mentioning later on because of their nutritional implications following surgery. So if you have surgery of the esophagus, it might be a very, very small tumor that might be removed easily. It might be a resection of the esophagus. If you think of your esophagus almost like a straw or a tube, it might be a middle section of the esophagus that needs to be removed and just reconnect it as if you're cutting out a portion of the straw and reconnecting it. However, a larger tumor in the esophagus may require not only a large part of the esophagus be removed, but it also may require a slight removal of the upper portion of the stomach, including that sphincter or valve that we just mentioned on the previous slide. And if that sphincter or valve is removed, the patient might experience reflux or heartburn. And if this is the case following surgery, first, a bland diet is generally recommended. So very spicy foods and very acidic foods would need to be avoided. Next, a person should remain upright for at least an hour after eating to help gravity play a role in allowing stomach uh, food, excuse me, to go down the esophagus and into the stomach. And then finally, medication might be needed, either over-the-counter medication or prescribed medication might be needed to decrease the acidity or acid within the stomach. And now as we go further down into the gastrointestinal system, surgeries involving the stomach might be involved. And again, the stomach is the primary organ that's involved with GIST. Um, the first simple surgery is called a wedge resection, where a portion of the stomach is removed, but those two valves that I had indicated earlier, the valve at the very top of the stomach, between the esophagus and the stomach, and the valve at the very bottom of the stomach, between the stomach and the duodenum, those valves remain present. So that's called a partial resection um, where those valves are still in place. And then finally, the third possible surgery involving the stomach is where the entire stomach is removed and one or both of those valves are removed during the course of surgery. So the general recommendations for surgery that involves any one of these resections are to eat small, more frequent meals that are spaced throughout the day because your stomach is smaller than before surgery. You ideally want to consume beverages primarily between meals and sip on them between meals, not consume a lot of fluid or beverages with meals. You want to eat slowly and chew thoroughly. And finally, vitamin B12 supplementation may be needed for the rest of your life either pill form or via injection. Another possible complication if you have the stomach removed and the lower sphincter or valve removed is you might experience a situation that we call dumping syndrome. And this is where the contents of your stomach will empty quickly into the next portion of your gastrointestinal system because that valve or sphincter has been removed during surgery. And there are actually two different types of dumping syndrome. One is called early dumping syndrome, and it roughly occurs between 15 and 30 minutes after eating. And the specific symptoms that you might experience are diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and vomiting. And then there's late dumping syndrome, which roughly occurs two to three hours after eating. And the symptoms are a bit different. They include weakness, sweating, and nausea. 
So there are specific nutrition recommendations in order to prevent dumping syndrome. The first three symptoms we've already talked about still apply, that you want to eat smaller, more frequent meals. You want to consume beverages primarily between meals and sip on them rather than consuming them at meal time. You still want to eat slowly and chew thoroughly. However, you now have a few other recommendations. You want to avoid the intake of food and fluid that has a very high sugar content. So if you have a bit of a sweet tooth with cake and candy and cookies, or if you end up consuming a lot of beverages that have a high sugar content like soda or punches or even fruit juice, you may need to cut back on those items that are high in sugar in order to prevent those symptoms. And some people also have symptoms of dumping syndrome if they eat too much starch or carbohydrate at a meal. So you may need to cut back on pasta or the quantity of rice or potatoes or breads or quinoa or other, other high starchy or carbohydrate foods in order to decrease those symptoms of dumping syndrome. You also want to make sure you have a, a protein source at each one of your small meals. And finally, if you're still experiencing some of the symptoms of either early or late dumping syndrome, you may want to try decreasing your portion sizes of fruit because fruit is high in natural sugar called fructose. So maybe not having a whole fruit at one meal but having half a fruit. You might want to vary the temperature of food and fluid to see if that makes a difference in your experiencing the dumping syndrome symptoms. Not being active after eating might make an impact on decreasing symptoms. And finally, trying to see if the positioning of yourself makes a difference. Some people will stay upright after eating. Other people have found that if they recline after eating, you know, even if it's laying on the couch watching TV with their head propped up, um, that will decrease some symptoms that have been hard to alleviate with other measures. The next part of the GI system that could be involved with surgery is the duodenum, or sometimes people pronounce it as duodenum, as I mentioned. And the duodenum plays a very important role in digestion. It's the primary site for iron and calcium and magnesium to be absorbed, although the duodenum itself is only about nine inches long. There's a portion of the duodenum that contains an opening into your gastrointestinal system from which bile from the gallbladder and pancreatic digestive juice containing pancreatic enzymes flow into your gastrointestinal system and play a really important role in digestion. And if the whole duodenum has been removed, then the bile from the gallbladder and the pancreatic enzymes are not secreted into your GI system. And you might experience symptoms of weight loss, uh, stools that are greasy or float on the top of the toilet bowl water. Your stools or bowel movements might be loose and frequent. You might have excess gas or flatulence. And you might have abdominal cramps after eating. So in addition to um, eating small frequent meals, we generally recommend that you have a diet that is not high in fat but moderate in fat and you spread the fat intake throughout your meals and snacks during the day so you don't have a large quantity of fat that you're trying to digest at any one time. And then finally, if you continue to have um, any or most of the above symptoms, you may need to speak with your physician about the possibility of a prescription medication um, called pancreatic enzymes. And again, that's specific to having the duodenum removed. Another thing that you may need to have followed if the duodenum is removed is you may need to have blood tests to check your iron, calcium, and magnesium levels since the duodenum plays a very, very important role in the digestion of those very specific nutrients. As we go further into the small intestine, we have the jejunum and the ileum. And as I mentioned, the small intestine has a very large part in digestion and absorption. The jejunum and the ileum make up roughly 22 to 23 feet in an adult, whereas, again, the duodenum is only 9 inches long. 
So it depends on the location and the length of the small intestine that is removed because of the presence of GIF um, for us to determine what nutrient deficiencies are likely to occur and to make sure they are monitored and then treated with supplements as needed. And as we move on to surgery for the rectum and anus, again, this only comprises about 10% of the site for GIFs. If you have surgery in the rectal area, depending on whether the last sphincter that we identified it on that diagram is present, you may end up with a temporary colostomy that will need to be in place, allow for healing following surgery, and then hopefully will be reversed. However, if the gist is very close to that anal sphincter, surgery might involve the rectum, and if a colostomy is needed, there's a good chance that the colostomy will be permanent. And in this case, um, whether you have a temporary colostomy or whether your colostomy is deemed to be permanent after surgery, what you're eating can definitely have an impact on the consistency of the output in the colostomy bag, the color, the odor of the output, and there are definitely foods that can also increase flatulence um, that may cause the ostomy bag to increase um, and puff out unless your specific bag has a um, venting feature. So now I want to go to some of the side effects of the medications that have already been discussed with the previous presenters for um, GIST. One common side effect of two of the medications is diarrhea. And in order to deal with diarrhea, there are very, some very specific nutrition recommendations, and they're all identified here with a check mark. Small frequent meals are generally tolerated best. You want to limit your intake of high fiber foods such as raw fruits, raw vegetables, and whole grain bread products like pastas and cereals and crackers. Um, you want to look at the food label to see what the fiber content is of the breads that you're purchasing, you know, the English muffins you're purchasing, the pastas, et cetera. Food labels can be very helpful in telling you the fiber content. You want to limit your intake of fried foods and greasy foods and foods that are very high in fat. Caffeine plays a role in diarrhea if you're drinking a lot of caffeinated beverages, whether we're talking coffee or tea or colas or even chocolate has a high caffeine content, you want to limit your intake. You want to limit your intake of very spicy foods as well as condiments that you use on foods. You might limit your intake of foods and drinks that cause gas. Um, the common vegetables are a group of vegetables that we call cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, legumes. If you're Drinking carbonated beverages, you may want them to go flat before you drink them. If you find that consuming cow's milk or any dairy products made from cow's milk increases diarrhea, you want to either avoid them or try lactate products. You want to try to limit your intake of very, very hot or very cold drinks. And then finally, if you continue to have diarrhea, Bananas and white rice can be helpful to firm up the stools. That's part of a diet that we sometimes refer to as a brat diet. And you may need to increase your intake of clear liquids like broth or diluted clear fruit juices and your intake of foods that are high in potassium like white potatoes and bananas in order to try to help replenish not only the fluids but the potassium that you lose when you're having diarrhea. And then as has already been mentioned by Dr. Williams, there are medications, over-the-counter medications and prescription medications that might be helpful for diarrhea um, should you need to progress to those. The next side effect that I want to mention of the medications is constipation. And similar to with diarrhea, in this case, you want to increase your intake of foods that are high in fiber, again, using nutrition labels that are helpful in telling you how much fiber is found in different bread products and cereals and crackers. You want to increase your intake of raw fruits and of raw and cooked vegetables to try to get in more fiber. Um, you want to 
Drink plenty of fluid, up to two quarts or 64 ounces per day. And the fluid can not only include, you know, water and broth and um, diluted juices, but also fruit ice is calculated as a fluid. Gelatin is calculated as a fluid. Sherbet is calculated as a fluid because at body temperature they are liquids. If you're able to, you want to increase your activity level. We're not talking about training for a marathon. You know, walk around your home, walk around the block, walk around a local park or a high school track. And then finally, um, if this is helpful, you want to try having a warm or hot drink or um, warmed up prune juice, room temperature prune juice, about one half hour before your usual time for having a bowel movement. One thing I do want to mention regarding fruits is that you want to try to um, avoid your intake of a lot of banana when you are constipated because bananas can tend to be constipating. The next side effect is nausea. And as Dr. Williams mentioned, you want to try to eat five or six small meals each day instead of three larger meals. You don't want to skip these meals even though you may be tempted to do so. You want to try to avoid eating foods that have a very strong odor, and you want to avoid locations where food is being cooked that has strong odors. So whether you want to hang out in the backyard while someone is cooking in the kitchen, or conversely, if you want to hang out in the house while someone is barbecuing outside, that might work. You want to try to be relaxed when eating, to eat slowly and chew your food thoroughly. You want to eat foods um, that are easy on your stomach, avoiding foods that are overly sweet, greasy, fried, or spicy. You want to experiment with temperatures. Some foods find that if you contain it, it, some people find that if you eat foods that contain ginger, like ginger ale, ginger tea, ginger chewing gum, even fresh grated ginger, not only for the taste sensation, but that that, that can decrease the nausea. If you wake up with nausea, you might choose to leave saltines or other plain crackers at your bedside upon waking, so you can end up chewing those before you get out of bed. Some people try medications for nausea. They set their alarm half an hour before they want to get up. They take a medication for nausea. They can go back to sleep for half an hour and then get up, so it gives the medication a time to become effective. And finally, if you do experience vomiting, you want to wait for about a few hours and then try clear liquids, then bland dry foods, foods like saltines, dry white toast, bread sticks, and dry cereal. And then uh, one more slide that I will go through uh, talks about mouth sores. Um, Dr. Williams did mention a few things here. You want to serve foods at cold or warm, or lukewarm temperature rather than hot. Very soft foods will be helpful. You want to avoid very um, rough or dry foods like toast or breadsticks. And again, you want to avoid very irritating spices or seasons or condiments or acidic items. High protein foods can help with healing. You may want to try drinking through a straw to direct fluid past the mouth sores. Sucking on ice chips might be helpful. If necessary, you may need to puree foods to make them easier to eat. And finally, as Dr. Williams mentioned, there are definite specific recommendations for mouth care and medication use. And the very last slide um, gives a variety of miscellaneous tips that don't occur with all of the potential medications. Lactose intolerance may be present. Um, you might experience excess gas or flatulence, and we've spoken about that. You might try over-the-counter products like Gas-X or Beano, or there are prescription products as well to help decrease flatulence. If your sense of taste has changed, you may want to try different food preparation methods, such as marinating foods, trying different spices and condiments as long as they're not too strong, trying tart foods or drinks, um, maybe trying a lemon drop or sucking on a lemon wedge before you end up eating. And finally, if you experience fluid retention, Decreasing the intake of high sodium, and food, high sodium foods and fluids may be helpful. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jean Ann, uh, for your time today. And thank you, um, Lori, also for an excellent presentation. We are very over time um, with a lot of information that was given over today. And um, 
we're not going to be able to answer the questions at this point, but we did um, collect them and we will get back to you after this webcast to see what we can do to have um, our expert panel answer your questions. Um, uh, before 